This is the aftermath of U.S. retaliation. B-1 bomber jets launched an air assault on dozens of sites in Iraq and Syria. Images posted Friday on social media show several explosions on the Iraqi-Syrian border. Syrian state media showed footage of what they say was one of the attacks. The 85 strikes hit seven different sites. U.S. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said, the U.S. targeted sites linked to Iran's Revolutionary Guard, or IRGC, and militias it supports. He said more attacks could be expected. So the signal is, to the IRGC and to these groups, uh, the attacks have got to stop. This wasn't just a message sending routine tonight. This was about degrading capabilities, taking away capabilities by uh, the IRGC and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the militant groups. These responses began tonight. They're not gonna end tonight. A spokesperson for one Iranian-backed militia said the strikes on Iraq failed to meet their objectives. Iraqi authorities say the strikes violated their sovereignty, while the Syrian regime says the attacks have increased the chances of the conflict spreading. On Friday, U.S. President Joe Biden joined grieving families to honor the American soldiers killed in the Jordan drone attacks. In a statement, Biden said, our response began today. It will continue at times and places of our choosing. For more, I'm joined now by Alex Vatanka, an Iran expert at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. Good to see you. Now, the U.S. has made it abundantly clear that Friday strikes were only the beginning. How far do you think Washington is willing to go in this? I think much will depend on the Iranian reaction to this or the reaction of groups that are seen to be close to Iran. Um, Clearly, the White House does not want to see a regional war. Clearly, the White House does not want to um, confront Iran openly for various reasons. That is not in the interest of the Biden White House. But again, you know, if there is a response uh, from the other side uh, that the United States just cannot let uh, go without responding again in return, then that could result in escalation. But I think clearly uh, right now the hope is that the message has been made the other side will take that message, will de-escalate, will stop some of these attacks that we've seen since middle of October. And if that happens, again, that in turn could give the White House a reason not to escalate any further in the short term, because they're leaving their options open. As you heard the White House say, they can choose the next round of strikes depending on what the other side does. So the ball is in Iran's court, you say. How do you think they will behave in this scenario? Look, the Iranian regime always plays a very careful cost-benefit analysis. Uh, you know, they are not a suicidal entity. They respect the might of U.S. military, and um, that is a major factor in their calculations. And we've seen in recent days that they've told their uh, proxy uh, uh, groups uh, that operate essentially under Iranian supervision to, to de-escalate. Um, but fundamentally, the problem here is not one of short-termism here in the next few days or weeks. It's something that's much deeper than that. It's sort of the root cause, I think, is in Tehran, in the ideological uh, worldview of uh, the Islamic Republic leadership, which, you know, for so, for so long, essentially decades, has stuck to this dogma that the United States is a bad, bad actor and needs to leave the region. If that continues to be the Iranian position, then you can only imagine that this conflict might not escalate in the short term, but it's not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, now, before we look towards the future, I want to look at one precise aspect of these U.S. strikes, because they were not only targeted at the militias, they also targeted Iran's Al-Quds force. What is their role in all of this? So the Al-Quds Force is the external arm of the Revolutionary Guards, also known as the IRGC. So they are basically the entity uh, that Iran puts in the region to advance Iranian regional agenda. So they are the ones who handle so-called Arab files, be it Hezbollah in Lebanon, 
what Iran has done over the last decade in Syria. Uh, you know, instructors, um, providers of finance, arms, missiles, most uh, sensitive aspect of it is obviously the, the supply of missiles and drones. So when you go after al Ghot's uh, force, you are essentially hitting the Iranian uh, state, uh, but you're not hitting it inside of Iran. And that clearly is one of the red lines for the Biden White House for now. They don't want to uh, strike Iran inside of Iran borders, but they're clearly hitting Iranian assets um, like the Al-Ghot's force outside. Yeah. Antony Blinken has warned that the Middle East is at its most volatile since at least 1973. Who really has the power, leverage and will to de-escalate tensions at this point? Because everybody says they're not interested in a wider regional conflict. And yet here we are. Look, I mean, the fault line right now in the, in the region is between the United States and partners and allies and Iran and its... Uh, much smaller proxy uh, groups that uh, you know I Iran works with. I don't see either side uh, at any time soon sort of giving up the fight. I think both sides believe in the cause and uh, both sides are, are set for the long-term uh, struggle. I mean, clearly that's the message we're hearing from the Iranian leadership in Tehran. They don't want to have a war with the United States, but at the same time, they think the cause of pushing the United States out and maybe bringing about the end of the state of Israel are worth fighting for. Mm. But that doesn't mean you you fight the big fight today, but you sort of uh, prepare the ground for that long-term mission. And I think that's that's basically where the Iranians are still at, the long-term mission uh, of, of playing strategic patience, making sure they don't fall into what they call a trap of a war today. Um, but again, you know, uh, that trap that Iran describes as a trap, uh, is what the American side will say. It's actually not a trap. It's a decision Iran will make with its eyes open. If Iran wants to escalate, then the United States might have to be forced to go there. You can call it a trap or not, but it's Tehran's call. Interesting stuff. That was Alex Vatanka from the Middle East Institute in Washington. Thank you so much for your insights. After the U.S. strikes, the European Union's foreign policy chief, Josep Borrell, called on all parties in the Middle East to avoid further escalation. We have been repeating once and again that the Middle East is a, a boiler that can explode. And that's why we, we call everybody to try to avoid an escalation. But we are living a, a critical situation in the Middle East on the whole region. It's no longer just... And as far as the war in Gaza continues, it's very difficult to believe that the situation in the Red Sea will improve. Because one thing is related with the other. It is a, a, domino, a domino effect in the region. Our Brussels bureau chief, Alexander von Naumann, has been following the meeting of EU foreign affairs ministers. They're clearly calling for restraint to avoid widening the conflict. I asked her if some of these cautious words are directed towards Washington. Yeah, you're right, Michael, at least to some extent. I asked, for instance, the Belgium foreign minister, Haji Labib, about her opinion about the U.S. strikes. And she warned of a real risk of spillover, saying that that is the reason for her country to call on everyone, also on the U.S., to exercise restraint, because only diplomacy can help calm down the situation in the region. But uh, there were other for the ministers who showed more understanding for the U.S. action and actions in the Middle East. The Polish foreign minister, for instance, Radoslav Sikorsky, told us that uh, the Iranian proxies had been playing with fire for years and months and that now this fire is burning them. And the undersecretary at the German foreign ministry, who was here, Anna Lehmann, also showed some understanding for the U.S saying that those uh, strikes happen uh, in response to the killing of the American so of three American soldiers and she also said that she trusts uh, uh, the US uh, and uh, uh, them saying that they don't want the situation to escalate so as you can see Michael there are very uh, different positions on, on that here in Brussels Alexander we only have half a minute but I do want to ask you this the top EU uh, diplomat Josep Borrell also said the situation can't improve as long as the war in Gaza continues. But can the EU actually contribute in any way to ending the war? 
I mean, the U.S. is, of course, a bigger player there in the region, but uh, we have seen a flurry of diplomatic activity with many European leaders and diplomats traveling to Israel, to Egypt, to Qatar to help to, to add this war. And they are saying they are intensifying their efforts because they think that the two-state solution is key to uh, bringing peace to the region. That's a DW Brussels Bureau Chief Alexandra von Naaman. As always, many thanks, Alexandra. Thank you.